Welcome to Origins of New World Civilization. Today, I want to accomplish a couple things. First, a few brief comments about archaeology, then some comments about cultural evolution, and finally, a quick overview of the rest of the course. This isn't a method and theory course, so we won't spend much time talking about archaeology, method, and theory in this class, but they are important issues and I want to start off by letting you know how I approach some of those basic issues. That way we can all start on the same page, so to speak. So archaeology is a kind of anthropology. Anthropology, at least in the US, is defined as the holistic scientific study of all aspects of the human condition. American anthropology is divided into four subdisciplines: sociocultural anthropology, physical anthropology, anthropological linguistics, and archaeology. And since all of these subdisciplines are deeply interrelated, to do archaeology right, you need to have an understanding of all four. Sociocultural anthropology is the conceptual and theoretical heart of anthropology. It studies society and culture mostly by direct observation of contemporary living societies. What an archaeologist is doing, ideally, is sociocultural anthropology through a filter. No direct observation, but the same goals. Anthropological linguistics is simply the study of human language. For prehistoric archaeology, linguistics might seem unrelated, and to a large degree it is, but by studying historic languages, we can sometimes learn something about those people's prehistoric ancestors. The next subdiscipline of anthropology is physical anthropology, also called biological anthropology. It is the study of humans as a biological species, and the roles that society and culture play in human biology. We can't study the human past without studying the human animal in the past, and a lot of archaeologists are also physical anthropologists. So, with a bit of thinking, you can see that all of the subdisciplines of anthropology are important for studying archaeology in general. Over the course of the semester, we'll encounter all of them in looking at the New World. But what is archaeology technically? By my definition, it is the study of the human past through material remains. Because it's not reliant on direct observation, archaeology accesses a deeper time scale than sociocultural anthropology and can study much slower, longer term processes. In this way, it's similar to physical anthropology and the study of human evolution. One of the basic concepts archaeologists use to understand the human past is culture. This term is used in two different ways in the field, however, and it can be a bit difficult to differentiate the two senses. My convention is to capitalize one sense and leave the other lower case. This is just my own convention, though. For other classes or in texts, you'll have to look at the contexts to see what the author means. Culture, capitalized, represents a concept in its more theoretical, abstract sense. It refers to the set of rules, ideas, and so forth that helps a person recognize, identify, and respond in social situations. That is, culture is all those mental concepts that reside in your brain about how to interact with other people what behaviors are expected, which are inappropriate, how to tell what other people are thinking, and so on. Culture makes it possible to live together with others as part of a community, because to a large degree, everyone shares those ideas. A closely related concept is material culture, those tools, buildings, and other objects that are created as part of social life. Material culture only exists because of mental culture, so looking closely at material culture can help us understand mental culture. We use material culture to uh, that we recover from the archaeological record to make our best guesses at the behaviors that produced it and infer culture from those behaviors. So that's capitalized culture. A lowercase culture is the group of people who share culture. It's the group of people who live together as part of a community and therefore need to share rules about how to do so. In archaeology, we recognize a culture by its people's shared material culture. That is, 
the people who make and use the same kinds of things are considered to belong to the same culture. Much of the semester will be spent looking closely at culture history of various parts of North and South America. That is, the sequence of cultural groups over time and when, how, and why one set of rules changed into the next. And how do we study all that? Well, obviously through archaeology. But what does that mean? As I said, methodology isn't the central focus of the course, but I think it's worthwhile to at least consider the sorts of data we access. Almost all archaeological data come from material culture, but only a small portion of material culture is preserved for us to recover archaeologically. That is what makes up the archaeological record the total set of all remaining evidence of past human behavior. There are four basic types of evidence that make up the archaeological record. The first and most basic is the artifact. An artifact is any object that was made or used by a human, and is usually used specifically for portable objects. The second kind of archaeological data is actually a kind of artifact but it's special enough that we usually think of it as distinct. That's a feature. Artifacts are anything made or used by humans. Features are artifacts that cannot be moved without being destroyed. A feature is, for example, a hearth, or a storage pit, or a house. The third type of archaeological data is an ecofact. An artifact is made or used by a human. An ecofact is neither made nor directly used, but nevertheless it carries evidence about human behaviors. Ecofacts tell us about the environment in which humans lived. Ecofacts include plant seeds, animal bones, pollen, and soils. The fourth type of archaeological data is the site, which can be defined as a location where humans performed activities and left evidence of those activities. Operationally, we recognize sites as clusters of artifacts and or features. We use the artifacts, features, and ecofacts found at a site to reconstruct the activities that took place there and fit those activities into a reconstruction of the past culture. Ideally, gathering these data and analyzing them would lead to not just a reconstruction of culture history, dry dates and place names linked to a catalog of material culture items, but also an understanding of culture process, the underlying rules and principles that govern how culture operates and how cultures change. To that end, it helps to structure our understanding of the past by categorizing cultures into different sorts. That allows us to compare and contrast culture histories from different parts of the world to begin guessing at those rules. In the American archaeology tradition, the classification system used by most scholars is the one first proposed by Elm and Service about 50 years ago. Service's system was first published in 1962 in a book called Primitive Social Organization. Service's classification scheme isn't used much anymore by cultural anthropologists, who've moved on to other theoretical issues than classification. The four categories are especially useful for, for archaeologists, though, because we study very great time spans, and over the lifespan of a single cultural tradition, societies may evolve from one form of organization to another. In services system, there are four categories based on their sociopolitical complexity. Band, tribe, chiefdom, and state. Each differs from the others in its sociopolitical complexity. Sociopolitical complexity can be measured by the number of social groups making up the society and the number of relationships among those groups. Bands have very few subsidiary groups with relatively simple relationships. States have very many groups with very complicated relationships. The simplest form of culture is the band. Bands are, on the basis of archaeological evidence, the oldest form of human society. All band societies are hunter-gatherers, but not all hunter-gatherers are bands. Bands are small, usually a single extended family, 
tied to other extended families through intermarriage. The polity itself is the band. The most important aspect of band organization is that they're egalitarian. Leadership is an achieved status. Insofar as there are any leaders, they are headmen, usually the fathers or elders of the band, or particularly successful hunters. They can negotiate with other members of the band and persuade others to let them choose where to go to hunt or which rituals to perform, but they cannot enforce their own decisions. In bands, politics are based on consensus. The next most complex form uh, is the tribe. Tribes can be either hunter-gatherers or farmers, sedentary or nomadic, but they tend to be horticulturalists or pastoralists more often than not. Their populations are rather larger than bands, a few hundred to one or two thousand. Because there are more people in a tribe, it is more difficult to tie them together into a single society. Whereas intermarriage and kinship tend to be sufficient for bands, tribes must use those methods and also add in other sorts of groups like religious societies or war parties that join non-kin together. The politics of tribes are rather variable. In many ways, tribe is another catch-all term for egalitarian societies that aren't bands. Generally, political decisions are still based on consensus, but the methods for arriving at those agreements are more formalized, perhaps in the form of a community-wide council. When the tribal polity encompasses uh, several villages, there may be more than one council, or inter-village decision-making may be more informal. The next most complex culture is the chiefdom. A chiefdom generally has anywhere from a thousand to several tens of thousands of people. To feed that many people in a contiguous territory, chiefdoms almost have to be agriculturalists. There are examples of hunter-gatherer chiefdoms, though, most notably in the Pacific Northwest and in California. The biggest difference between chiefdoms and the simpler forms is that chiefdoms are no longer egalitarian. Chiefdoms are rank societies. Leadership is ascribed according to genealogy. Important social positions, most notably that of chief, are inherited. Chiefs are needed in chiefdoms because, now that there are multiple thousands of people in the community, voluntary societies, marriage, and kinship are no longer up to the task of integrating everyone into a single society. Chiefs are full-time political specialists, people whose only job is to run the local government and make sure that people can continue to live together in a single society. This includes managing public works projects like irrigation, contacts with outside groups, and managing the economy of the society. The chief alone, or with the help of a relatively small number of aides, is enough to manage that task. The most complex polity that service described was the state. States are always agricultural or industrial, because the number of people in a state has increased over that of a chiefdom. Because they're so large, integrating and regulating so many people is a difficult task. This time, in addition to the chief, you get the development of a professional bureaucracy. These are officials whose job it is to oversee just a portion of the government, priests, generals, ministers of state, etc. A king or other supreme government coordinates the bureaucracy, rather than managing matters directly. State-organized societies never evolved in North America, but there were many state societies in Mesoamerica and South America. As we're examining the culture history of the New World this semester, we'll see that over time, Native American cultures evolved from band-organized societies to states. These changes were not always one-directional, though. At various points in history, cultures evolved to become less complex and smaller in size. So don't mistake these categories as stages. They're just useful labels that we can use to help us organize our thoughts about the past, not absolute declarations of what must have happened. For the rest of the semester, we'll be talking about the archaeology of the New World. Because that's such a huge area, it's not possible to cover everything known about two continents in one semester. 
Instead, we'll focus on three regions that highlight the most important cultural developments. The Eastern Woodlands in North America, Highland Mexico in Mesoamerica, and Peru in South America. Let's start with a quick discussion of the environment and geography of the regions we're looking at. I'm hoping that most people already have a relatively good idea of the geography of the eastern U.S. The boundaries of the eastern woodlands are very much open to debate, but generally stretch from the Gulf of Mexico to the Great Lakes and from the Great Plains to the Atlantic coast. Before it was cleared for agriculture, this was a region of large rivers and even larger forests. A continuous forest, mostly deciduous hardwood and transitioning to conifers at higher elevations, covered most of the region. The only major mountain ranges in the region are the low Appalachians and their subsidiary ranges like the Blue Ridge and Smoky Mountains. Finally, along the Gulf and Atlantic coasts is a low-lying coastal plain, typified by marshes and swamps and cypress instead of the oak and hickory in drier areas. Mesoamerica means literally Middle America, but to archaeologists it is not synonymous with Central America. Mesoamerica is a region of widespread cultural interaction that stretches from north-central Mexico into Honduras. Central America, to archaeologists, is between Mesoamerica and South America. The American Southwest uh, actually stretches south of the U.S.-Mexico border for a couple hundred miles. Highland Mexico occupies the central portion of Mesoamerica. It is a mostly mountainous region defined by the convergence of mountain ranges that run along both the Pacific and Atlantic coasts of Mexico. To the north is the desert of the American Southwest. The elevation of much of the highlands is quite high, making for a cool, semi-arid environment of forests and scrubland. The Mexican East Coast, Veracruz, is a low-lying coastal plain with many rivers and mangrove swamps. To the south lie the arid mountain valleys of Oaxaca, and the southeast transitions into the broad, flat Yucatan Peninsula, which is outside the region we'll be studying. South American geography is defined by the massive Andean Cordillera, or mountain range. The most complex societies to arise in South America were located in Peru, along the Pacific coast, just south of the equator. More than the other two regions, this is one of geographic variability. The low-lying, flat, coastal plain is one of the most profoundly dry deserts on Earth, watered only by short rivers flowing east-west from the mountains to the sea. The steep, high Andes rise from this plain to heights of over 20,000 feet. Native Americans can live at elevations of almost 15,000 feet, and the steep, narrow valleys and fast-moving rivers of the Andes were incubators for ethnic diversity. On the eastern flanks of the mountains, the impenetrable Amazonian rainforests mark yet another geographical zone. Obviously, cultural developments were not synchronized across such a large area, but the most surprising lesson of New World archaeology is that, despite how different the landscapes are, cultures all wrestle with the same sorts of problems, following the same general developmental trends across thousands of years of history. That, of course, is the subject of our class and what we'll be examining over the next 15 weeks. Hope you enjoy it.